Okay, great. Thanks, Ken. Uh, that was great. You basically talked about everything I was going to talk about. No. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. No, we, we coordinated, so we're trying not to overlap, but there's so much to talk about in so little time. So hopefully, maybe even if you hear a few things several times, it'll be uh, uh, stimulating to you and easier to remember. I want to thank um, this organization for all of their collaboration the last few years and for this meeting and for um, inviting me to come give a uh, quick talk and for all my colleagues that we work so hard with, including patient partners. Um, so. With that being said, I'm going to give you some flavor of the, the two types of disease that Ken just mentioned, uh, some flavor about uh, therapy for the disease and some of the challenges we have with uh, new therapies or need for new therapies and what's on the horizon. So uh, first off, uh, one of my questions a few years ago was uh, just what does NTM look like? And there was so little epi. Jen and Becky and a number of us uh, did an, uh, some epi studies. Uh, some of which were highlighted uh, by Jen in her talk, but uh, this was pretty simple. We just took everybody in Oregon over a seven-year time period, and we figured out that, uh, let's see if I have this pointer here. At the bottom, uh, you can see in red, 77% of all NTM disease is pulmonary. So that means 23% is extrapulmonary. Is anybody here a fan of extrapulmonary? <laughs> no, okay, nobody cares about it except for me. But. Uh, <laughs> I do care about it, and I, I want to show you some, some interesting extrapulmonary disease uh, things later because, you know, it's an important group of people also. Um, the other thing we found out was that overall, 84% in the upper corner, 84% of all NTM is, is MAC. Now, this is Oregon. It might be slightly different in other states. Jen showed some nice data from Hawaii that's slightly different. Uh, but by and large, these are probably close to what we see uh, nationally. Uh, the other thing is the age issue and the gender issue, which has been already discussed several times and has been reflected in the EPI by, by Jen and uh, Ted Maris and other colleagues, uh, Becky Previtz, et cetera. But I think this is interesting. I've always been on this uh, kick that, hey, I see a lot of male patients. And um, Ken mentioned the Lord Windermere's. We call them Dudemere's in Oregon. <laughs> uh, but it's the same people. And you know, they're out there. And so I, you know, we looked at our data in Oregon, actually, and it was very interesting. What we saw, and you can see the, I think the right, the red is females, the blue is males. But before the age of 60, at least in Oregon, this is a male predominant disease, just barely. It was like 52% to 48%. So um, I think that's important to note. And then the epi switches gradually over time as, as there's aging. There's probably various reasons for this. Uh, Ken mentioned several of them. Maybe women go to the doctor more than men. Maybe women outlive men. I mean, there's other reasons why we might see more disease in women uh, than men. But uh, suffice to say, we do see this uh, almost becoming a 60-40% type thing or 55%, 45% thing, female to male as, as uh, individuals age. And you can see the incidence. And this is not prevalence. This is incidence. So these are new cases per year. Almost all the epi data you see are prevalent figures. These, these are people that just got disease, or at least were just diagnosed. So the incidence in an 80-year-old, it's almost 30 per 100,000, which is still pretty rare, but it's a heck of a lot more common than other things uh, that a lot of us worry about. So um, again, it, it's important to recognize that this occurs in both men and women, and both old and young. So the two disease types, uh, Ken uh, mentioned both of these, and I think Ann did a bit in her talk too. So there is this older smoker, COPD type of disease where this was originally um, described uh, in a VA system in the southeast. And uh, this is more common in men and it is much more common in smokers or prior smokers. Uh, however, we do also see it in women who are smokers. Uh, then there's the Lady Windermere or Lord Windermere and Dude Windermere thing. And again, these people all look somewhat similar being tall and skinny, uh, sometimes with scoliosis and this has been, been mentioned. Um, in terms of the x-ray findings, this is, a, this is a classic thing that happens all the time. This woman walked in, they thought she had TB. She has, it's hard to see, but she's got this little right upper lobe uh, lesion here. You can't quite tell it's a cavity until you do the CT scan, but it's really classic, beautiful little cavity in the right upper lobe. She came into the system, quote unquote, as a TB suspect, quote unquote, although don't, we don't use the S word anymore. For those of you who do TB control, suspect is stigmatizing, so now we call them 
uh, you know, potential TB people. <laughs> it's better that way. Everyone feels better. Anyway, so this person came in as a potential TB person, and uh, it turns out they got put on four drugs, they closed down her workplace, they all went crazy. You know, it was the usual story, and then, you know, four weeks later, it turns out it was Mac, and it was all Mac. She was a smoker. She looked like she had kind of the male, quote-unquote, form of disease, but it was really a classic COPD-associated uh, cavitary MAC. And then the other presentation, this is just a nice picture. Uh, this was a woman with right middle lobe bronchiectasis who was also colonized with pseudomonas, and she just went back and forth between MAC and pseudomonas uh, for many years, uh, often at the same time. Uh, and you can tell this is a very thin person. On the top of the scan there, there's very little soft tissue. Again, this is that tall thin uh, person. Now, I, I will say too, I don't know that they have to be that tall. I got plenty, plenty of women who, uh, and men who are not that tall, but they just have very thin body habitus. So the risk factors for uh, this, so you know, some of these have been talked about and Ken's elucidated a lot of these. I mean, bronchiectasis, obviously Ann mentioned this. This is uh, uh, probably the number one risk factor and it's also probably caused by pulmonary NTM too. So there's a chicken and egg type scenario there. CF and then various other uh, diseases, anti-alpha-1 um, antitrypsin and emphysema, et cetera. We talked about this. There's always a debate about GERD. Um, GERD is reflux disease. All of us have reflux, depending on how much we drink every night. And, uh, you know, how much of that actually promotes NTM, I think, is an open question because because it's such a ubiquitous uh, condition. Uh, but I, th I certainly see patients where I believe that that's a driving factor, and I'm sure my colleagues do uh, as well. And then there's always a debate over gardening and hot tubs. But I will say, there is no question in my mind that hot tubs are a major source of infection, at least in my patients. I have so many patients that were fine until they got a new hot tub. And again, this is anecdotal stuff. But, um, and we've gone to hot tubs, we found isolates, we've matched them up with the MAC in the lungs. I know it happens, we all know it happens. Um, so anyway, for people who have risk factors like bronchiectasis, you know, sitting in a hot tub might not be a good idea, uh, at least not with the jets on. So I have patients who sit in the hot tub with a mask on, N95 mask, with no jets. How's that for fun? <laughs> uh, rheumatoid arthritis. This is something that I work a lot on, particularly immunosuppressives around treating rheumatoid arthritis. Some of you may have rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it's a very ubiquitous or a fairly common autoimmune condition. And um, there's no question that, that some patients with RA also have lung involvement that's autoimmune, which then sets them up for acquiring uh, MAC and other pulmonary uh, infections and other NTM. And this was a nice study done by some colleagues in Asia where they took a database in Taiwan and they just followed people after RA diagnosis. And you can see that uh, this is the instance of NTM in patients on RA. I don't know if my pointer works, but the, the top part is the instance in people uh, in RA uh, with RA, and the bottom is the instance of NTM in people without RA. So the difference was about fourfold. So having RA increases your risk of getting pulmonary MAC about four times. It's definitely a risk factor. One of the reasons is the therapies, and anti-TNF therapy was mentioned a couple times here. Uh, this is kind of the oldest biologic therapy we have at this point. They've been on the market for about 20 years. It's tumor necrosis factor alpha. It's an important cytokine that your body makes to control mycobacterial infections and other infections. It also drives in inflammation. It drives RA. So we target it to treat RA and a number of other inflammatory conditions. But you can see, if you just look on the right, that's the instance of pulmonary MAC and people on TNF blockers. And that's the gold bar. And if you look at TB, uh, that's the blue bar. So it's about double NTM versus TB risk. And the right side of that image is the risk in RA on TNF. And if you look on the third, or just to the left, that's RA people without TNF therapy. So clearly the risk is much higher if you're on a biologic therapy like TNF. More recently, and I took all my slides out because I didn't think I'd have time, but there's a number of other biologics that may be as important or more important than TNF blockers in terms of promoting uh, these types of infections. And one of them is called the JAK, JAK inhibitors. And I didn't know JAK in t about JAK inhibitors until about several years ago, but we're definitely seeing these types of infections 
uh, in those, and those are kind of the new wave of therapies that will come replace TNF drugs eventually. Um, I always want to mention steroids too, because steroids are old drugs and we use them ubiquitously, and there's no question in my mind that oral steroids increase the risk for a pulmonary NTM. And in the last five years, there's accumulating evidence that says inhaled steroids probably do so as well, although probably not to as much extent. Uh, there's three studies here, and there's been another one published more recently as well, and there's two that I've recently reviewed as a reviewer that aren't published yet. But uh, again, there's a number of studies showing that if you use corticosteroids inhaled, you probably are at higher risk for uh, pulmonary NTM. So just briefly about treatment, I know Dave Griffiths, I think, is going to be here later to talk about treatment. Um, the gold up top says the decision to treat, uh, or diagnosis does not equal the decision to treat. And for those of you who are patients, you know this, and, and actually physicians here know this, you don't treat everybody. Some people have very subclinical or very indolent disease, and you don't need to treat it. You can treat it with exercise, with uh, you know, airway clearance, things that are not antibiotics. Um, sometimes we observe these patients for, for a while until, uh, you know, look, this is a very patient-centered disease. And I'd always tell my patients that, hey, I, I can treat you whenever you want, and I'm waiting for you to tell me when you want to be treated. And, you know, sometimes you see things on the scan or there's other factors that, you know, influence you to give a strong recommendation towards treatment. But a lot of this has to do with the patient and how they feel and, and when they feel bad enough to accept the treatment. The treatment is uh, generally right there, macrolide, rifampin, and ethambitol. Amikacin, we usually use IV, although now we're starting to use it in inhaled fashion. And those are pretty much the drugs for MAC. Uh, that, that's it. I mean, we kind of have four drugs. And maybe there's a couple others, which I'm going to mention here in a second. But that is how we've been handling this disease for, for a long time. So here's the Griffith Frustration Index. <laughs> and I always love this, because Dave's frustrated about most, thing, most things in life. Uh, but, but maybe more so treating Mycobacterium simiae at the bottom there. It's very, very hard to treat. But you can see that Max kind of in the middle. Uh, meaning it, it's frustrating for both the patient and the physician because it's hard to get rid of uh, and there's other problems that I'll mention in a second. Abscessus, which is, uh, was mentioned in some of the prior talks, is an is a even more difficult to, uh, bug to, to get rid of and I'll mention that too uh, in a second. So for abscessus, which I actually see a lot of, I was happy to see in Jen's slide that Oregon is a purple state or black. I don't know what it was. I'm colorblind, but it was really dark, meaning we have a lot of abscessus, which is great for you know trials and stuff and things like that, but it's not good for patients. So if I, if I could figure out a way to prevent abscessus, I would. We don't always know where it's coming from. There is this uh, group of people that are co-infected with MAC and abscessus, and what happens when we treat their MAC is their abscessus seems to do better because we're wiping out their MAC, and this happens all the time. Um, we looked at our epi data in Oregon. There was something around 10 or 12 percent of people with MAC at some point isolate uh, abscessus, so this is not an uncommon phenomenon. But abscessus is even worse. It's basically sensitive to those four drugs right there, and actually almost never cefoxitin, at least the abscessus variety we have in the Northwest. There are other abscessus subspecies that are more easily treated that are seen more frequently elsewhere. But in the Northwest, we have almost always abscessus subspecies, abscessus, and it's basically susceptible only to tigacycline, amicase, and imipenem. Um, in terms of the therapeutic unmet need, I, I just mentioned briefly, but cure is very difficult to define in this disease, whether it's MAC or abscessus. We look to try to get people's sputums to go negative in terms of the culture. But it doesn't always mean that the bug's gone, and the relapse or reinfection rates, like Ken was mentioning, are fairly high, and both of those phenomena occur, such that you know, three years after therapy completion, probably half the patients have, have relapsed or become reinfected. And that's really specific to patients with the bronchiectatic type of this disease. Uh, those numbers are different prior for those with cavitary disease or COPD-related disease, where it's even higher. Tolerability of therapy, I mentioned those four drugs we tend to use. Tolerability is not uh, always that good. Um, I think that with intermittent regimens and I think with being creative about how patients take these drugs, we're pretty successful at getting everyone to tolerate them 
uh, everyone meaning about 80 to 85 percent, and we're presenting a poster of our experience at ATS uh, this weekend. But, um, but you know, it's variable, and it depends on the patient, and you, you can't just do this without thinking about it. Uh, it often requires creativity and work. There are some serious adverse events to worry about. They're rare. Optic neuritis maybe occurs in, the, in about one to three to 500 people, depending on age, and that occurs with the Thambitol, which we use uh, om almost all the time in these patients, uh, with MAC anyway, and that is a serious adverse event we try to avoid. Um, there are a number of other issues, including drug-drug interactions. I just mentioned this as one issue with tolerability, but there's a lot of people that you can't use rifampinin or it's very difficult. And you can see all these interactions with drugs that some of you may know about or, or are on or don't know about and never want to know about. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be on any of those drugs, even though it looks like I'm on one of them. I'm looking at the list here. But um, the bottom line is it's hard to take rifampin if you're on any of these therapies. And uh, uh, azithromycin tends to be a much easier drug to use, but again, even there, there's some drug-drug interactions you have to be aware of. Uh, lastly, we worry about resistance, too. So macrolide resistance, I'm sure Dave will mention it, so I'm saving that for him, but that is the big one we worry about, resistance to azithromycin or clarithromycin, and that's why patients always have to take at least two drugs, if not three drugs, to prevent the emergence of that resistance. We also now know that amikacin resistance is important, and this was uh, work from Texas a couple years ago, and it, and it did report on the use of inhaled amikacin and some emergence of resistance. So some of the other drugs coming down the pipeline, these are things that we're going to have to think about uh, creatively to try to prevent. So uh, one thing we've done creatively with NTMIR and a number of colleagues and patients here in the room is we brought together a patient-centered Funded, funded by the PCORI Institute, the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute. We've worked very closely with NTMIR uh, on several projects with them, but we funded this patient consortium where we asked patients to help us design trials, similar to the FDA workshop, uh, and you know, asked for what they thought was important. And one thing they really wanted was more effective therapies, and patients wanted to take fewer therapies. I don't want to take four antibiotics. I don't want to take three antibiotics. Why can't I take two? Why can't I take one? I mean, these are the things that we think about. So shorter duration therapies and fewer antibiotics. And uh, luckily, we were able to get a grant just recently with most many of the people in this room where we'll have a clinical trial network of about 25 sites studying whether patients can get away with azithromycin and ethambitol alone uh, versus having more drugs than that on board. Uh, some of the newer drugs we're working with, too, we have a randomized control trial, again, with many individuals in this room, uh, looking at clofazamine. Uh, this was work uh, published a couple years ago, which was really important for providing preliminary evidence for getting that grant and that trial funded. But uh, in the middle here, you can see that the people who are on a clofazamine-containing regimen in the dark bar, 100% of these people converted their sputum versus the people on the right where they didn't have clofazamine but they had rifampin instead, it was slightly lower. It's about 71%. Now, again, this is not a randomized controlled trial. It's retrospective. It's observational. It's really just hypothesis generating, but it was enough for us to, to present this evidence to FDA to say, hey, why don't we study this in prospective fashion? So FDA funded a randomized controlled trial to look at uh, clofazamine. The other therapy in the pipeline is inhaled liposomal amikacin. Uh, this was a study that Ken published a couple years ago. The phase three uh, data is being presented here at ATS this weekend. The phase two study th that was uh, published looks very similar to the phase three study and that uh, the people, uh, let's see those bars, those are different timelines and the, this is the percent of people converting their sputum uh, on the left versus the right. So the people on the left are the people on the drug, the people on the right are the people who weren't on the drug. So you can see that differential there. And in the new phase three data, you saw something similar. Uh, the drug was significantly associated with sputum conversion and people seemed to benefit. So I think that, that is a potential future therapy option if it gets approved. Um, in terms of pulmonary hygiene, I think Chuck's gonna talk about this so I won't dwell on it. Chuck's not gonna talk about it, he usually does. Other people are talking about it. I'm an infectious disease doctor. Well, actually, I'm not really anything, but it, that's another story. But, uh, you know, I, 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 most of my colleagues don't think about this. Uh, we think about antibiotics, and we don't really think about clearance. And I, I think the pulmonologists are really good 
about reminding patients about this and the importance about this. We don't have a lot of data sometimes about the benefits of this, but I do think it's important and I think it's worth noting. And then the last couple uh, slides, just to get some extra pulmonary stuff out of the way. This was the coolest outbreak I've ever been involved with. Um, this guy, Arthur, I got consulted like five or six years ago by the Derm Division. Hey, Kevin, come down and look at this guy's leg. I've never seen anything like it. So I walked in the room and I was like, wow, I haven't either. <laughs> Uh, and it wasn't just his leg. He had this all over his body, this hard, woody. It was kind of like felt like a, a tree branch. In, in Oregon, we hug a lot of trees, so I don't know. <laughs> tree trunk. I mean, it felt like a trunk, the cedar tree in my backyard. Anyway, we biopsied it, and uh, it didn't grow anything out. We biopsied it again. It finally grew out Mycobacterium marinum. And on his way out the door, he says, well, geez, it's weird that everybody on my island has this. And I said, well, what do you mean everybody on your island? I was like, what island are you on? And he said, well, I'm from Sadawan, which is way out near Papua New Guinea in the Federated States of Micronesia. So I, since I'm an academic and I have nothing better to do, I started making phone calls. And I called my buddy from CDC who had just done an MDR-TB outbreak in, uh, in the Federated States of Micronesia. I was like, hey, have you heard of this island? He's like, no. I was like, have you heard about this disease they call SPAMS disease? That's what they call it, SPAMS disease. And the reason why they call it Spam's disease is any of you, have any of you ever like eaten Spam? Yeah, it's pretty good actually, huh? So, but if you're like me and you kind of open a can and only eat half of it and you leave it on the counter for a couple days and then come home before your wife gets back from out of town, it's, there's this crust on top that looks exactly like that. <laughs> Hence the name Spam's disease. So, that's what they call it. So it turns out we got a team together and we went out to the Federated States of Micronesia's island of Sadawan. We treated this guy below with a, a year of a couple drugs and you can see his infection got quite better, but that was only after a year. We did a case control study on the island and it turns out that the risk factor for getting this mycobacterium marinum infection was swimming in that. And I know it looks inviting to jump in. <laughs> But it turns out, and this is a great story, the Japanese bombed this island in the early 40s in World War II. They filled in the bomb craters with water and they introduced a fish called the Medica fish, which turns out uh, is great at mosquito control and that's what they did, they wiped out malaria. But it's also well known to be colonized with Mycobacterium marinum. So this is an outbreak that's been going on since World War II. And it, yes, about half the islanders have this and the risk factor was swimming in this pond. So, uh, since then, we have told them to stop doing that. <laughs> I don't know if they're, they're stopping. And lastly, I'll end on this. This is a Buddha. Yes, he is happy, but if you look really closely, he's got measles. This was a Mycobacterium coloni outbreak of Tattoo Inc. This was Tattoo Inc. actually manufactured very close to this very hotel that turned out that it was full of Mycobacterium coloni. It was distributed nationally. Uh, this was the index case that we had in Oregon, and a colleague at CDC worked it up and published it, and then we published this case report titled, Happy Buddha? <laughs> That's the end of my talk. Thanks, guys.